All righty, here we go. Thank you for joining us for today's event. This week, the Society of Illustrators, along with several of our friends, are hosting some great presentations for you. Even though Mocha Fest was not able to happen this year, we felt it was important to highlight our comic and cartoon arts community. So we created this week of virtual events and received overwhelming responses. We are so happy to be sharing some wonderful creators with you. Thank you to everyone who is participating this week. I'd like to introduce to you today's speaker, Sean Martinbrough. Sean Martinbrough is the author of How to Draw Noir Comics, The Art and Technique of Visual Storytelling, published by Penguin Ran Random House. He's a creator artist whose DC Comics, Marvel, and Dark Horse Comics projects include Batman Detective Comics, DMZ, Luke Cage Noir, The Blank Black Panther, and Hellboy. Sean is also the artist of Thief of Thieves by Robert Kirkman, the co-creator of The Walking Dead and Invincible. Sean co-created characters featured in the films Zack Snyder's Justice League, Deadpool, and the animated Batman Gotham Knights and the television series Gotham, The Gifted, and Batman, Batwoman, sorry. Sean is the artist of Promete, 1313, presented by Comixology and French publisher Delacroix Soleil, and a featured contributor to Vanity Fair's The Great Fire issue, guest edited by renowned journalist and writer Tanahasi Coates. Sean is the writer of Red Hook for DC Comics. His two-part story revisits the neighborhood of the hill and introduces new characters to the Batman Gotham universe. Sean is currently writing and illustrating his first cre creator-owned graphic novel for the new Abrams books. John Jen um, imprint, sorry, <laughs> graphic novel for the new Abrams books imprint Megascope, founded by New York Times best-selling author John Jennings. The noir jazz-themed thriller is set in contemporary New York and Paris. Sean is also the artist of Like Lava in My Veins, a children's book written by multi-award winning and New York Times bestselling author, Derek D. Barnes, with publisher Nancy Paulson Books Penguin. Thanks so much for doing this today, Sean. Thanks, Kate. That was excellent. Your check is in the mail. I, am, <laughs> I almost sound respectable. So uh, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been, it's, it's uh, awesome. I'm always honored when the Society of Illustrators reaches out to me to work with them and speak with people about my craft and um, my storytelling. So it is a pleasure to be here and I hope that I can somewhat be, I can be somewhat interesting for the next hour and a half. Wonderful, thanks again, Sean. Okay, all right, thanks, Kate. Okay, everybody. So once again, um, I'm Sean Martin Grill and thank you for tuning in. And um, I'm literally going to sort of break down how I tell a story. I've been working in the comics industry for uh, quite some time and I've told a lot of different stories and I've broken as an artist and now I am doing more writing. So I'm actually bouncing back and forth between telling stories as an artist and as a writer. And it's pretty, it, it's a great um, uh, expression of creativity. So during this chat, please, uh, everybody, you know, feel free to ask questions, uh, ask me anything. There are no dumb questions. So we're all friends here. We're all fellow artists or art people who appreciate art and storytelling. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. Okay. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is today, I'm going to actually like the name of my talk says, this is all about telling a story. And I was going to say how to crack a story, but um, from a visual sense and from a writing sense, but telling seemed a little bit more straightforward. So I'm going to start with two different projects, two different types of projects and two different types of writing, uh, as well as uh, drawing. And so as a professional writer, you're going to get projects that are what they call work for hire. And these are projects that are done for other companies and usually involve characters that you do not own. And so you basically have to play in their sandbox. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what it's like to create your own characters for a creator own project, which means that you are the one in charge, it is your world, you can create whatever you want, there are no limits, there are no parameters. So I'll just sort of go into how approaching the writing differs from those two different types of projects. So I was thinking about, well, what would be pretty cool to talk about for a work for hire project? and. A uh, project that was really cool and fun to work with was my most recent Red Hood story for DC Comics. Um, and so if we break that down, uh, I was approached last summer by uh, uh, DC Comics, in particular, Ben Abernathy, the Batman Group Editor. Shout out to Ben. 
um, Ben reached out and was like, hey, Sean, I, uh, would you be interested or would you be available to write and draw a two-part Red Hood story? Uh, because what they were doing, they needed a sort of placeholder story before they started their big uh, crossover event, which was going to be Future State. They were just wrapping up their current crossover event, which was Joker War. And like I said, they really weren't sure what they wanted to do with the character. So they said, hey, listen, um, can you create like a fun crime noir story since noir is my, my thing and that's kind of like my style. Um, just like a standalone story that would just sort of bridge the gap between Joker War and Future State. So I said, okay, sure. Um, so we're gonna start with the subject. Now, I wasn't too familiar with the Red Hood. Um, and so I had to do some research. And first, Ben was really great uh, to, to hop on and, and give me like a, we were on the phone for like an hour with him filling me in on what the Red Hood has been up to for like the past 50 issues that have, have gone on, um, which is pretty interesting. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay, that I remember that character. That actually was one of the Robins because I remember when this comic book came out that shows how old I am. And the Red Hood is one of the, Robin characters uh, with Batman. And so I said, okay, great. And then as I started doing more research and as Ben was really filling in in terms of what the character has been involved in over the years and you know, he's had the comics, he's also had the animated series. For me, I'm like, okay, well, let me figure out what story I could come up with for this two part story. Um, sometimes as a writer, you have to kind of figure out, all right, well, what's, what are my parameters? What can I do and what I can't do? Now, since this is a two-part story, it's a standalone story, I really couldn't create anything major. I couldn't change the character in a, in a major way. And it's kind of funny because when I said that in interviews, fans were like, oh, well, why does he want to change the character? And I'm like, well, if you're reading a character, like Red, has, Red Hood had come out, that they, I think they had like 50 issues. The Red Hood has to change somewhat over those 50 issues. But since I'm only doing a two-part story, I really couldn't change the character drastically. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, in reading the Red Hood, I could see that the real conflict there with the character was him butting heads with Batman and how they deal with vigilant, vigilantism in a different way. So I said, okay, that's an interesting conflict. And you also, you always wanna start with the conflict of your story. And so I said, okay, well, what if we sort of, what if I explored that and sort of said, okay, well, let's play with the idea that Jason is estranged from Batman and that's pretty much what he was. He was. He was estranged from Batman. Uh, he's kind of. He has his own group of characters, the uh, the uh, the outlaws. But in this story, he's detached from them. That was the parameter that was given by editorial. Um, so I couldn't use any of those characters. And so I said, all right. Well, if we play with the fact that Jason is estranged from Batman, he's kind of alone. And over all of these issues, he's always sort of been alone. He doesn't really have any major relationships. What if we introduce him? to a family. I said, okay, that could be something. And so then I was like, okay, well, let me kind of play around with this. And since this is gonna take place in Gotham City, I'm like, well, it'd be interesting to sort of take the readers to someplace new, but familiar. And I, I'm a firm believer on sort of using what's already come before and at least there's some kind of familiarity. And there was a story that I had created for DC Comics. Uh, it was, called The Hill. I was the artist and the writer was Christopher Priest. Um, we did this one shot issue back in 1999. Uh, it was a, a really cool thing, but it really focused on this neighborhood called The Hill. And The Hill was a neglected um, area of Gotham City. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, no one really went there. Crime was really rampant. It was a very depressing uh, place to sort of hang out. And so, so I said, okay, all right, well, that could be interesting to sort of use that as the setting. So basically I'm having Jason go to someplace new, but it's still within the Gotham confines. So that's how I cracked that part of the story. So then I started developing uh, and sort of figuring out the characters that would sort of, that I could populate this with. Because since, like I said, I can't really do anything major with Jason's character. It might be interesting to play out Jason's conflict with Bruce with other characters. And so this image right here is, this is the cover for the hill, which is, the original story that I was sort of piggybacking on for this story. Um, and in The Hill, the major character of, the major villain of that story was a character called Demetrius Corley. And he was sort of like a local 
crime boss and eventually Batman takes him down and he puts him in jail. And I said, okay, well, that could be kind of interesting. Now, The Hill came out in 1999. So we're talking about 20 years. And I don't think DC has ever really done anything with The Hill, the neighborhood. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to sort of bring it back. And I said, all right, well, with any major metropolitan city, things are going to change over the course of 20 years. And so if you look around in your own neighborhood, your own hometown, chances are things that might have been run down 20 years ago, this is prime real estate. And it's, you know, a lot of times like it's been bull bulldozed, there's a new condo. So I said, well, what if we what if we reimagine the hill in 2021? And this image right here is just sort of like the way I went about designing the hill back in 1999. I was the artist. So it was the, the, the concept of the hill was basically like this sort of massive cemetery that was in the center of this neighborhood. And the neighborhood was basically walled off by this huge freeway overpass. So in the very far distance is downtown plush, um, you know, really ritzy Gotham. And in this neighborhood, it's, it's this sort of depressed neighborhood that's sort of like walled off by this huge overpass. And I thought that was a very interesting visual. So when I went to developing, when I went to developing this, I said, okay, well, it could be interesting to sort of this now, which was a crime infested neighborhood is now minutes from, these, minutes from downtown. And so people would be moving in, property values would go up, you'd have new, you'd have brownstones being renovated. I thought it could be kind of interesting to say, well, what if Jason, because Jason comes from money, he's got that some sort of access to Bruce Wayne money. What if back in the day he had bought some property in the hill, dirt cheap, like a lot of people do. And so I basically wrote, came up with a story where basically Jason is coming back to town after his previous exploits in the Red Hood series. He's coming back to Gotham. He doesn't want to go back to Wayne Manor because he's estranged from Bruce. Um, and But he goes to sort of hang out at this property that he owns in the hill. And when he goes to the hill, that's when he encounters his uh, old friend um, and she kind of brings him into what the new story would be. So when I'm developing the characters, I'm thinking, okay, well, uh, what typically do, do I not see in Gotham? And that's where it's kind of, that's where I said, all right, well, let me introduce uh, two twins. And I came up with the names Dana and Denise Harlow. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to have these two sisters that were, that represented kind of two different perspectives on what was going on in the hill. And since Batman is, has a built-in duality to it, it made sense to sort of make them twins. Um, I named one Dana because I was watching a documentary on hip hop and they were talking about Queen Latifah. Queen Latifah's real name is Dana Owens. So I was like, all right, Dana would be cool. Denise was like a nice kind of old school kind of classic name. And, that's, and then Harlow has this old kind of retro um, kind of crime noir feel to it. I thought that was an interesting flow. So Dana and Denise Harlow would be two characters that Jason's now interacting with in The Hill. I made Denise um, a news reporter because when you're cracking a story, you have to always think about ways to convey the interest, you have to convey the, the information of the story. And I knew that I didn't want to have a, a character monologuing throughout this two-part story. And that's when a character is kind of like, um, when they're letting you in on their thoughts and they're really kind of guiding you through the story. Um, and usually that's in a caption and they'll say, oh, when I walked in here, it was kind of cold and I wonder what's going on and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't want to approach the writing from that way. So I needed to have a voice of someone who can kind of convey information. And so I made De uh, Denise Harlow a journalist, a news journalist. So right off the bat from the story, I could just sort of have her tell you what happened and what's potentially going to happen in the story. And I thought that was a really cool narrative device. With Dana, Dana is a, she is a small shop owner. She's a, she's a small business owner. But since I'm tying this, this story into the events of what happened with the Joker War, Joker War was this event where basically people were just wilding out. It was almost like the purge going on where people were just ransacking and robbing and creating mayhem in the streets of Gotham. I thought it could be really kind of interesting to have the citizens, the people who lived in the hill, band together and sort of protect the neighborhood from these outside marauders. And I thought it'd be interesting to have Denise on the one hand, who is a news reporter who goes, to, goes by the book and to have her sister be someone who's a vigilante. And so in this image right here, this is an image of Denise 
Harlow and her um, TV program, The Harlow Hour. Uh, this is a great illustration done by the artist I work with on this named Tony Akins. And it was inked by Stefano uh, Gaudiano. And it was colored by Paul Mouse. And it was lettered by Troy Piteri. Um, and so this is a, a final image from the, the series. So this is pretty much how I opened the story. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, I have the two sisters that Jason's gonna be interacting with. Who's gonna be the sort of the, who are the bad guys gonna be? And I approach this as a Western where you have your good guy, the, the cowboy coming in to a small town and he gets caught up in a, a pre-existing conflict. So basically the bad guys, I was like, all right, well, what the bad guys, you know, had a sort of different kind of interesting look to them. And I tied the leader of the bad guys into the Hill story that I, that I worked on back in 1989. So as I mentioned, the lead character there was a gangster named Demetrius Corley. And this is his son. And I thought that that could be a great tie-in from a previous story to now. And so with this story, there was so much new content that we were going to be creating that I figured that I would help out um, artist Tony Akins and do some designs of my own. Uh, well, because he was busy designing um, Dana and Denise and so much other stuff that I was like, all right, well, here's some of my thinking. So these are designs that I did for Corley Jr., who was one of our bad guys in the story. And basically what Corley Jr. is doing is that he, by night he's robbing things him and his crew, they put on these African masks because the original, because his father had a very uh, keen interest in African art. And so I figured that'd be an interesting carryover to the story. So I designed them with all of this, these African arts, but then there's, there's some little kind of current kind of hip hop touches, which is like the, the thick multi rope chains around the neck, um, the, the hair, the tats. And so this is sort of like, this really informed how Corley's crew is gonna look. So if you go further, if you go to the next one, the next image, you can see his crew. This is a final version of Corley that was drawn by Tony Akins, which was awesome to see. Um, and it's just our initial introduction to him in the story. Um, the next image would be his crew. And you can see how I'm playing, I'm bringing the African aesthetic and I'm kind of combining it with a, uh, like a militaristic, like kind of militia approach. So, but, but basically these are, and so these are like another set of villains for the story. Um, but since this is a crime noir story, you know, I, to me, the best crime noir stories have a twist. And so there was another character that I wanted to introduce and that's the character of Tommy Max, which is Tommy Mizell. And Tommy Max ends up being the, the main villain of this story. But it's a bit of misdirection. So it's a bit of misdirection when I you start reading this because you're thinking that Corley and his crew are going to be the bad guys, but ultimately Tommy becomes the real bad guy. And for Tommy, I really was saying, I think I kicked around um, to Ben the idea. I was like, all right, well, let me think of a character that we really haven't seen in Gotham before. Um, and at first I was thinking, well, what if we kind of Kind of did like a riff on maybe like Takashi 69 like this really whacked out character with tats and just bouncing all over the place but then I was like okay that's a little too similar to the Joker um so let's kind of go away from that and what I really started playing around with is that what if he were more of an Andy Warhol type which is he is a more creative guy that dips his toes into the criminal life and then I came up with an idea of making him a fashion designer because I kind of wanted this character to be connected to the streets, the streets of Gotham, because this whole story is pretty much street level. Like there's no one really with superpowers in the air. Uh, but I thought it could be really interesting to kind of play around with having Tommy be this streetwear designer that has a taste for the crime life. But more importantly, he, Tommy's whole perspective was that he feels that he can do it better than everyone else. And I almost, so I, I really wanted to sort of make Tommy a combination of an Andy Warhol, who's an eccentric, uh, eccentric artist type, a creative type, and fuse him with a typical social media fanboy who thinks that they know how everything should be. They have the best ideas. This is how, this is how a movie should be done. This is how a TV show should be done. This is how a comic book should be done. And so during the course of the story, Tommy is sitting back and seeing other people doing things. And he's like, you know what? I want to do that. I can do that better. You guys are screwing up. I want to do this better. So now I basically had Jason Todd, 
his conflict with Batman, with Bruce Wayne. He's coming to this town of the hill. He's interacting with these two sisters, uh, one of whom is a vigilante like him. And then she's going and battling other, you know, criminal types. And then you have this new character that sort of develops out of this, which is Tommy Max. And the and my whole approach with the the sisters and, and actually Dana, I thought Dana was an interesting character because she's basically playing out the conflict that Jason Todd has with Bruce Wayne. And so I thought that could be a very interesting way to kind of explore his inner conflict, give him something to chew on and think about by him seeing his friend Dana pretty much playing out how he might interact with Bruce, you know, AKA Batman. And that was pretty much the central approach to the story. Um, and then, like I said, this is, this is, this is a detail of Tommy. Uh, I was playing around with my art, with the artist, Tom, uh, Tony Akins, I said, well, Tony, how about if we give him something kind of distinct, like a mask? And what if like the mask had all these tattoos? Because originally his design, he had, he was tattooed up, but that was a bit much. And I said, well, what it, it could be interesting if we just gave a mask that had tattoos. And then we really kind of honed the design down to where we were really just focusing on Gotham. And it's, it's so great being an artist to work with another artist and and come up with ideas. And that's like one of the fun things about working in comics because you work with a team of other people. You know, comic books, you have your writer working along with the artist, working along with, um, with the penciler, the inker, the colorist, the letter. And it's really fun to sort of play with every, to, to work with everyone and see what they bring to the table. And so Tony and I did a lot of work on this. He actually did a lot of work on, on uh, nailing down the specific look of Tommy and even like the one eye drip um, if you if you sort of go back to his full outfit, you know the thing about Tommy is that Tommy's influenced by Batman Rogues Gallery villains, and in the story, it's referenced that he had put out a line of sneakers, a line of hoodies that were um, that were influenced by Poison Ivy and the Joker or whatever, and his new muse is Killer Croc. And that was another way to introduce another element to this story, because when Ben first approached me about this, I said, okay, well, can I use some of the Batman villains? And at first I really wanted to use um, Clayface. That was gonna be the main villain. So then Ben said, well, let me check to see his availability, which is hilarious um, because you have to make sure that continuity wise he is available. So, um, he got back to me and said, well, Sean, you can't use Clayface because Clayface is on the straight and narrow. He's not, he's not involved in criminal activity anymore. So how about Killer Croc? I said, well, all right, you know, Killer Croc, let me see, but maybe I can present Killer Croc in a different way. Something that's more interesting that they'll throw the readers off a little bit. And so I decided to sort of put the Killer Croc in a suit and, and make him more sophisticated in terms of his look. But this whole thing with Tommy Max and being influenced by Killer Croc as a muse is pretty much the way like we were, I was introducing Killer Croc into the story. And like I said, the designs on the right, uh, the, the black and white art is, is my art. And that's sort of what I, that's what I gave to artist Tony Akins as a guide. And I'm like, this is what I'm thinking about for Tommy. Like he would, you know, be dressed like in a hip hop streetwear, but they would have they would have touches and flares um, of Croc, Croc's texture, his scales, and then to, if you look to the right, the final drawings are Tony, and Tony is just amazing. He just really made it look so real, and that was just a really great um, approach to you know just just visualizing the character. It's a total example of the team effort between you know writer and artist, and actually two artists working together. So if you go down to the next one. Okay, so now another group of characters that I introduced here were, like I said, the hill is being protected by a group of vigilantes that are basically people that live in the hill and they're protecting it from any people who are participating in the Joker War. And so I'm like, all right, well, let me kind of design, let me help Tony and design a bunch of the uh, vigilantes but also make them grounded because these are people that literally live there. So they don't have superpowers. They, they can have access to things that you and I would have. They wouldn't have a bat suit, 
but they could sort of put together outfits that you know you and I could put together. And so I did a bunch of designs and this would be Dana's crew that she runs around with. And um, I said, all right, it could be interesting even though one of them's wearing, holding a gun here, ultimately we're like, all right, let's not use any guns. They just use sticks, bats, possibly knives. And that's sort of, that would be their offensive weapons for the whole story. Um, so if you go forward, so then I basically had the basic elements of my story and I was really kind of pulling you in. So in the beginning of the story, you see uh, an, uh, an interaction between Dana and like Corley's crew. And then that sort of establishes what kind of environment that Jason is entering in the story. Um, this is a great panel, probably one of my favorite panels that, that Tony drew um, where you're just showing like the relationship between Jason Todd and this new character that the readers haven't seen, but we enter, but we want to jump in the story and show the readers that okay, these two characters have a connection, and I just this is just such a great visual in terms of like the love and the warmth that these two characters are showing, and uh, we're like having Jason basically be the eye of the reader coming into this new environment because the reader doesn't know what's going on, and so as a writer, you want to figure out okay, who's going to be the guide into the story. And so Jason is our guide. He's, he hasn't been to the, to the hill in like 20 plus years. He hasn't been to the hill in forever. So this is all new to him, which basically is the reaction that the readers would get because the readers haven't seen the hill in forever. And so different scenes, having him sort of get a guide, guided tour of the hill by Dana was a way of me introducing him and the reader to this new environment getting them acquainted with the level of a friendship between these two characters. And, you know, that's the fun thing about a story, which is sort of setting up these characters who have their own inner mo motivations, their own inner conflicts, having them come together and then having some of them butt heads. And so if you go to the next image, this is a great example of Tony's initial drawing and then our cover artist, one of our cover artists, Dan Mora, did this amazing art. So this is the really fun thing about comics, which is just so, it's so fun to create because something that I wrote, an idea that I had in my head that I sketched down in my yellow pad and then I type up into a document, it goes to the artist, the artist visualizes it, and then the cover artist visualizes what we visualize. And it's just the fun art of creating something new. And so now this is the cover that that uh, the first of the two issues, which I was just blown away when I, I saw it by Dan Mora. And uh, I'm a huge fan now. I wasn't familiar with Dan's work before, but this just really blew me away. So, so this is basically like the, so the overall approach to cracking a story and then designing the characters. Um, and what really helps in designing the characters is figuring them out motivation wise, like what drives them? What are they gonna do? And the, over the course of the story, we reveal that Dana has this alter ego where she's this vigilante. And basically what Jason sees is like his whole conflict that he has with Bruce Wayne play out with Dana. And he's like, well, listen, are you sure you wanna cross this line? Are you sure you wanna go this far? And he's almost the mentor to this person who's sort of doing, who's just getting started to do what he was doing. And that's really like the fun part. So if you were to go to like the final art um, of this, you can see how once the script was laid out, um, this is an example of the pencils. So Tony Akins, our artist, starts drawing it out. Um, he would send us layouts to sort of check out and I might give him notes here and there, but you know, Tony's work was just so beautiful. The pencils were just so, so detailed. And we're basically just showing this is showing our main character, Jason Todd, going back to Gotham. He goes back to this brownstone that he hasn't seen in a while. Then we introduce our, our new character, Dana Harlow, in the next shot. And it's like a lot of great acting moments, you know, between these two. And I just love the, the way Tony drew this. It was really awesome. Uh, here's a colored, uh, the next image is going to be like the colored version of Paul Mounts. And you can see how comic books are put together. They're really put together in layers where you have the penciler, then you have the inker, then you have the colorist, and then they add the, the words. Um, but if we keep going here, you can see how 
the hill is a much brighter place. And that's something that I really wanted to communicate to our colorist, Paul Mounts. And I said, well, I want this hill to be different than the original hill that I introduced in 1999, because this is no longer a depressing place. It's, it's been gentrified. And so it's bright. They have food trucks. There are different you know, types of people that are living here. Um, and so this is them literally doing something that you don't really see too often in comics, people just hanging out, eating and talking. And I got to plug in my favorite, my favorite biryani cart from New York City. Um, whenever I go, I'm a native New Yorker. So when I go back to New York, there's this amazing biryani cart on 42nd, no, 46th Street and 6th Avenue that I always go, that I always try to visit whenever I'm around in town. And they make these great cotty rolls that are just amazing. I'm like, I want to put that in the story. And so I actually sent Tony uh, a photo reference of the role and he just nailed it. This is a great scene though. Um, it's a great scene because when I was writing the script, there was so much and God bless Ben, he really was patient because I had way too much story to, to go into, let alone two issues. And, but so we were looking for ways to kind of condense and that's one of the great things or one of the approaches that I always have when I'm telling a story, uh, which is, um, I always try to sort of edit, you know, whenever I'm drawing, whenever I'm laying out a story myself, I'm always trying to streamline the action. And that's something that I carried over to my writing as well. So I'm always trying to sort of write less um, and sort of do more with less in terms of wording. And this is a great example where when I gave him the script page, I think I had like our main bad guy who was getting out of his car in the last panel, um, I think I had him driving by Jason and Dana while they're eating. And, and then he pulls up to his brownstone and Ben made a great suggestion. He was like, hey, well, why don't you have him literally pull up to um, like, you know, pull up right across the street from them. So you're literally tying the two, uh, the characters together in the same location, which I thought was a great idea. And so the way, um, if you've noticed, panel one, the, the you know, the, the friends are eating, they're talking and then behind, in panel three, uh, over Jason's shoulder, you can see like a car backing up into a spot and then you see our main character. And then the next page would continue him in a different scene. But it's just really great just sort of coming up with these different scenes and different locations to kind of show a different side of the characters <clears throat> and also show the readers something that they don't normally get a chance to see. And this is something that I was also thinking about with Jason Todd, which is Jason Todd is a really, is a real badass vigilante and he's killing people left and right. He's, doing a lot of damage, but it would be really cool just to show, to, to, uh, to sort of slow him down and show him <clears throat> the average things, the average everyday things that he might not be experiencing because he's always out being a vigilante. And so this was a nice sort of grounded sort of human scene just to show him just sort of hanging out and eating like lunch with a friend, you know? So we go to the next page. So this is like the opening page, which definitely is one of my favorites. <clears throat> um, there's no dialogue on this. There's no lettering on this page, that's a, but there is lettering in the final page. And this is really just showing a bunch of different, um, it's telling a story using a bunch of different angles. So we basically open, out, open up with our lead, one of our new characters, Denise Harlow. She's giving a news report. So she's letting the reader know exactly what happens as soon as you start uh, reading. And then you sort of cut to a POV angle of someone looking at a car on a street. And then you see the car explode. And then you see the person who's responsible for it, which is one of our uh, antagonists. And that's Corley Jr. I love the way this page is colored by Paul Mounts. I mean, like the, the different types of color, you know, the way it pops. And I love the way Tony just sort of just nailed the expressions of the characters. I love seeing characters act. So that was a really, I, I, one of my favorite pages. Go to the next page. I think this is where, in the beginning, like I said, you're showing two uh, groups butting heads. And so this is Corley's crew butting heads with um, Dana's crew, uh, which are sort of arriving on the scene. Um, and it's just a great use of different angles to sort of pull you into the story. Um, a funny note is when I was writing this, a comic. I had 22 pages to tell the story. That's the standard size of a comic book. Um, <laughs> and I started writing this opening scene and I got to about page eight and I was still in the opening scene. It was like so, 
so much detail, so much action. And I'm like, whoa, like I'm almost halfway through my 22 pages with this opening scene. So I cut this opening scene way down to like, I think two or three pages, you know, because I had to be very conscious of my page count. Um, and so I literally just cut, 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 stripped it. And one of the great things about telling about working in the comic book medium is that you don't have to write as much because the images are going to be doing so much of the heavy lifting. And so here, you know, you're getting the, you're seeing what's going on. So you don't have to write as much. And I really just wanted to keep it moving, keep it tight. And here you go. I think this is really great. I love that last panel big time. Go to the next page. Let me see. <clears throat> this is another, this is a scene that happens later in the first issue where Dana is introducing Jason to her crew of friends. And like I said, when I first approached the story and when I was cracking the story, I'm thinking, okay, let me introduce Jason to what he's been missing for the past 50 issues. And this is an example of a bunch of friends getting together and having dinner. And he, you know, and, and he goes dancing. And I thought it was a really great opportunity just to sort of not only give more information about what's going on in the plot by introducing these new characters, they're kind of giving us more information about the hill and what's been going on and what they're about. And then at the end, there's sort of like this nice little moment between two friends, Dana and Jason, where she's like, come on, like, you know, relax, let's start dancing. And that's something that I've never seen Jason Todd, AKA the Red Hood do in 50 issues. So I thought that was a really interesting sort of break for his character. Um, next page is another scene. This is in the in part one of this story, we're bouncing back and forth between characters, but this is sort of like the rise of our real villain, which is Tommy Max. And Tommy Max has got into a fight with um, Corley Jr. And once again, he's really feeling like, you know what? Everyone else is stupid. I gotta show him how it's done. And so what he does is he goes to his influence, his inspiration, his, uh, his muse, Killer Croc. And he's like, listen, I want you to work for me. I'm gonna make it worth your while. And Killer Croc's like, okay, I want a suit and I want, this is what I, this is the amount of money that I want. And it's just a really fun scene to sort of show Croc in this, in this sort of, um, sort of strip club type atmosphere, just sort of casually sort of drinking with a baseball cap on. I thought it was really funny. We're trying to figure out what the, what the sports teams were in Gotham. I don't remember what we, I remember Tony and I were asking Ben, like what sports teams did Gotham have? And I forget what Ben told us. I think it might've been a, I'm not sure if it was a baseball team or a hockey team or something, but Tony came up with a cool logo and that was that was it. But this scene is really one of my favorite pages because if you look in the background of the top panel, just the attention to detail that Tony spends uh, on the guys in the background looking at the, the girl dancing on stage, that's another example of storytelling. And it's always great when you're telling a story, not only do you have the words telling a story, but the art is telling another layer of that story. And if you're working with a really great artist, there's always something extra. There's always more to the story that's being told in the background, you know, uh, than what you're reading in the foreground. And this is another, this is a great example of that. Go to the next image. Let me see. Okay. <clears throat> this is a great example of storytelling because yes, it's fun to write dialogue. It's, I, I, I like writing the snappy back and forth banter of the characters. Um, but I always wanted to do like a quiet panel where there was no talking and it was just simply um, sounds and atmosphere and mood. And in this particular uh, page, Jason Todd is sitting on the rooftop of his brownstone and he's doing something that he probably hasn't done in a long time, just relaxing, having a beer, looking at, you know, look at the traffic in the circle. And then he notices that someone's watching him on a rooftop across the way. And then when that person gets distracted by a, a, a noise from the street, they turn away. And then when they turn back to Jason, he's gone. And this just really sets up that Jason is a force to be reckoned with. Even though he's chilling, he's on his downtime, you know, Jason can disappear the way Batman can disappear. And I thought it was a great quiet panel that had no dialogue. It was just fun to do. Paul really did an amazing job with the colors. Um, Tony and Stefano did a great job with just the the lines and the blacks, the shadows, 
Um, I, I, one of my favorite pages of the whole of the of the whole story. But once again, it was great to be able to sort of convey and keep the storytelling going without using any dialogue, which I'm pretty proud of. And I always say that this is a homage to the classic Larry Hama, uh, Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe issue 21, that was like the silent issue where they, it's called Silent Airlude. It's like no dialogue for the whole issue. One of my, one of the best comics ever done. Okay. So if we keep going, we can look at the, the cover art which is pretty much encapsulating the whole story. Um, that's the amazing thing about cover artists is that you get to tell a, a story in one image. Um, I just thought Dan Mora killed it. You just completely knocked out the park with the way you visualize the characters. Um, uh, and then if we go to the next one here, it's almost like a little bit of a reverse where you now see Dana in her superhero outfit. It was a blast seeing a character that you created be visualized and now they're part of the DC Comics universe. That's awesome. You see uh, Dan's take on Tommy Max and then you also see his take on Dana's sister, Denise. And Denise plays more of a role in part two, um, uh, but, but it was great setting her up in part one. And that's one of the things that I'm very conscious of when I'm writing a story, which is the setup. You have to set up every element of your story. And what I say, mean by setup is that you just can't sort of have things happen arbitrarily because that seems very, it, it's, it's not as effective when it comes to writing. Everything has to sort of be established before you touch on it. So um, part one was a huge setup for part two. And there were a lot of things that I set up in part one that end up paying off in part two. So if you go on to the next one, this is, uh, this is our variant cover by uh, Cahill. Oops, in, uh, Engu, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but he is amazing. I wasn't familiar with his art before, but this is just an amazing variant cover. And so I, I just thought it was great. So basically with this Red Hood story, it was a really fun exercise to sort of play in someone else's sandbox, play with characters that some of them are already established and I get to introduce new characters. And then it's also a fun challenge to kind of work within the parameters of editorial, because like I started off by saying, I just couldn't write any kind of story that I wanted. I had certain rules that I had to follow in writing the story. And, you know, it just made me more creative with, with regard to conveying a story, but respecting the rules. And so at the end of the story, there is a sort of full circle with Jason and Bruce Wayne. Um, uh, not that there's a big change, but there could be an opening of, there could be a thawing in the relationships between the two. And then we've also firmly established Dana and her crew, what's going on with them. And we also establish, um, there's a little bit of a, uh, a come up it's, and a um, sort of surprise plot twist that happens in part two. And I, I always find it very interesting to sort of create a bit of a twist because ultimately this is for the readers, the people that buy these books and go to the comic shops. You want to take the people on a ride. You want them to kind of not really, you don't want them to know where the story is going as soon as they start flipping through the first couple of pages. And so I was pretty proud of how this came out. I thought the whole creative team was amazing and I was really happy, um, you know, just working with everybody. And it was a fun thing to, to sort of you know, get my feet wet playing with the, the Red Hood and reintroducing some familiar elements. And so that basically was what I started off by saying was a work for hire, which means that um, I was hired to do a job and I, I, I did it and I don't own those characters. Um, uh, but, um, you know, and you have to work within a structure because you're playing in an established sandbox that has rules that has, that's already, it's a machine that, that's going. And so now we're gonna switch gears to something that's a different type of writing and a different type of drawing, which is a creator own project. Now a creator own project is something that was completely my imagination. Uh, this is something, a story that I'm doing with uh, John Jennings. John Jennings uh, is an amazing uh, writer. Uh, he's a, a professor, he's an artist, and he started a new imprint at Abrams Books called Megascope. And uh, John was, had reached out to me and said, hey, listen, I'd love to work with you on something, um, something kind of grounded, maybe with a little bit of the fantastical, uh, what he got. So I thought about, okay, what could I come up with? And that's the tricky thing about being a writer is that you have so many ideas in your head. It's like, okay, what do I start with first? And so I thought, okay, 
the idea I have, if I'm gonna, if I'm, I always try to approach a story and say, look, what are the major themes of the story? So for the Red Hood, the major theme of the Red Hood was family. Um, and this, the, the major themes of this, this project are, is change and it's, yeah, it's about change. I think change is the major theme of, of the heavy and that's the ultimate, but that's the, the, the title of this project. Um, it's gonna be all in black and white. And this is a very grounded project, meaning it's very street level, no superheroes, no, fan, no, no you know, monsters or anything like that. But this is basically a story about a debt collector, a guy who collects debts. And uh, he, you know, if you borrowed 50 bucks or if you borrowed $500 and you can't make that payment, He's going to come knocking on your door asking for the money on behalf of the person that you borrowed it from. And so I basically started off with that kind of a premise. And it was interesting to sort of take this character and sort of take a journey of um, take you into the world of this sort of criminal underworld that's, that's going on in New York. It's contemporary. It's set in contemporary New York and Paris. Um, i huge fan of jazz music. And so I thought it'd be really interesting to sort of infuse jazz into this story. Um, and like I said, the main theme is change. And so it's about this guy who's sort of been doing this job for a while and he's comfortable doing it. But then people are telling him, listen, things are going to be changing. And, the, and that's the basic theme of the story. And you see how different characters are going to change to these new elements. And so when I'm playing around with developing, um, so that was like the basic idea. And I don't want to go into the idea. I don't want to spoil the idea. But that was sort of like the, the, the quick premise. And this is the fun thing about being an artist and a writer. So now basically once I kind of wrote out this, once I figured out the idea, uh, I pitched it to John in a treatment. I think the treatment is maybe like 30 pages um, for a 155, 160 page story. Um, he loved it, Abrams loved it. Um, we did the deal and then we, um, and then I started writing the script. Uh, I wrote the script pretty fast. It took me a while to kind of get started, but uh, once I banged out the script, then it became time for me to draw it. And so I had to start doing layouts for my own script, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so you can see here how I approach telling a story from panel to panel. And so these are what you would call thumbnail layouts which are basically how I take my script page, which is pretty much formatted the way like you would see a normal television or a film script. Um, and I break it down panel by panel. And I kind of have the descriptions, I have the words there, and, I, and that's my blueprint. And these are how I visualize it. And this is pretty much where I spend the most of my time um, editing, like I said before. Um, not only do I edit the scripts, but I'm editing like my visual storytelling. So I'm constantly revising the angles, establishing where the blacks are gonna go in terms of the shadows, uh, the angles, what's the best way to tell the story visually. And it's fun because I get to sort of, since I'm the writer as well, I can kind of make little adjustments as I go. And so you can see here, these are really just tight, small blueprints to how the actual art is going to play out. Um, I put little notes um, there. So when I'm, I think I sent these into Abrams to just take a look. I think yeah, their marketing needed a certain amount of pages. So I gave them pretty tight layouts because sometimes when I'm really moving fast, my layouts look like hieroglyphics. They look like chicken scratch. You wouldn't be able to sort of figure out what's going on, but I can. But these are pretty tight so that because other people are going to be looking at them and I have little notes in terms of the dialogue where it would go. And um, yeah, so this is like an example of the layouts. And then from these, once I nail these down, I use these as the blueprint for my final, the final art. And if you can look at, you know, if you can compare those to the final art, then you really can see how closely I stick to my layouts. So you saw this scene in a very simple layout form. And, uh, you know, this is how the final pages are going to look. Now for these, for this story, like I said, it's going to be mostly in black and white with some spot red color here and there. Uh, Christopher Sotomayor is the amazing colorist. He's going to be spotting the reds. And I am so fortunate to be working with the veteran letterer, John Workman on this. John, for those of you who don't know, has been, he is a beast when it comes to lettering and designing. Um, it's just 
amazing to sort of work with him and see him visualize my script into words and placing them because not only am I guiding your eye with my images, the word balloons are guiding you as well. And so this is an example, like actually, if you go back to like the previous page, this example of really sort of setting a scene and visualizing a scene. Um, so we start outside and actually go back one more. Yeah, go back. Let me see if you go back to, oh, yep, yeah, that's it. So for those of you that live in New York City, this is in the meatpacking district, uh, maybe about a couple of months before I travel up to New York. Um, I'm a native New Yorker, so I always have, I always make this little visual notes of cool locations to use at some point. So I took a lot of reference shots. I was hanging out with my sister Tiff, shout out to Tiff. And uh, I shot a bunch of reference of the meatpacking district and I chose a particular set of buildings that I thought would be good. And then I use a ton of, I'm always Googling reference uh, like locations and details because I try to make my artwork look um, as legitimate as possible in terms of what I'm drawing. So we basically start off with an establishing shot of our main character walking, kind of shadowy, kind of moody. You don't really see his face. On the second panel, he's looking over his shoulder. Um, and then the third panel is like an, an above bird's eye view shot of him in, approaching his building. And then once he's in the building, he's, um, let me see, hold on, I see a text message. Do you run my pages by workman where I'm thumbnailing him to accomplish balloon placement? You know, I probably should. Uh, someone asked, do I run my layouts by the letterer before I draw the final pages? Uh, I don't, I really should, but John's such a pro, he can handle whatever I throw at him. So he usually, I, John just gets the final pages and then does his thing. So, so going back to this page, you can see how I'm just basically changing angles to sort of make the story interesting and help with the flow of the story from left to right. So you see our main character put the key into his lock, then the next page, he enters his apartment and it's a sort of shadowy, you know, there's a lot of shadows there, but your eye is drawn to actually him coming in. Everything else is not really, it's not really important except for the background element, which is the illuminated room where the piano is sitting. Um, it's kind of dramatic to see him through the panes, the window panes of his divider door. And then he basically puts on a record, sits down at the piano, and then there's this really surreal moment where, you know, he turns, someone else is there, and then you would have cut, you cut to like the next page. And it's this sort of dream sequence where he's imagining that his mother and his father are in the room with him and his mother and father are deceased, but it's an emotional scene where I was like, okay, how can I convey this um, in one image? And you can see how his parents are translucent, meaning that you can see through them which suggests that they're not really there, but also his face is really, you know, like really um, emotive of the scene. And, you know, I use a lot, I use dramatic lighting here to really make the scene that much more dramatic. And then if you go to the next page, you know, they're singing, he's imagining this while he's playing the piano. You cut to his mother is singing, his dad is playing the piano and he's happy. And then the record ends and then we cut back to the present and he's all alone in front of um, his piano. And for me, like that's really sort of a story visually. Now I wrote that out, but I wrote the page, but I didn't have any dialogue. I just pretty much had stage directions. Um, but you know, that's sort of constructing a scene, um, you know, using no words, but using really using light and shadow. So if you go to the next page, let me see. Let me see. Do I have? Is that it? Let me see. Uh, if we kind of keep going down, are there any pages with the lettering? Oh, okay. Okay. These, these are cool. These are examples of John Workman's lettering. So these are the pages that I just showed. But now you can see the placement of the lettering, which is such an art form. I always tell people, usually there are very few people that can create comics that can do it all. Um, I am by no means a letterer, and so it amazes me when I look at true artists that are letterers like John Workman and the type of fonts that he uses where he places the words to sort of guide your eye in addition to what I'm doing and the sound effects, even that last little click when he's putting the, um, the, the key in the lock is just amazing. John's just such a beast. You go to the next page. I don't think there's any, yeah, I, yeah there's a voice over here. So like I said, 
when I was talking about the Red Hood story, I didn't want to use a voiceover approach to writing that story. But in this story, I am. So you have our main character really kind of talking us through the story and as it's going. And it fits like an interesting um, thing. Because I knew that this character, this story is going to be traveling to so many different things that I needed to have some kind of a vehicle to sort of help the reader follow the story along. But I just love the placement of John's words. And then we really played around with using notes. So if you look at the splash page where he's sitting there playing the piano with his mother and his father, you can see little notes, musical notes that are sort of almost blending into the piano. Um, but I just, you know, I just thought that John did such an amazing job with that. So we go to the next page. And once again, you see the notes in the first page, bringing you through, guiding your, guiding your eye and then it kind of stops. And then when the music stops, the notes stop. And then we kind of, and then I do this thing, this, I, I always find it interesting when you, whenever you are watching a film or a TV show and they do a transition, a lot of times you'll have the voice of a new scene overlapping on the pre-existing scene. And that's what I did in the last panel where you see him sitting at the panel by himself in shadow, that little caption is like, someone says, how you doing? And then we cut to our main character, like looking away as if he's lost in thought. And he's like, what's that? And then you see that the sound effects. And I just love the way John visualized the sound effects of this guy punching something off camera. And that's the way I wrote it. And I was really happy with the way it came out. And typically I'm like my own worst critic. I, I, I'm never satisfied with anything, but I'm pretty happy with the way that transition worked out. And the way you see this character sort of punching something off camera, but you don't know what it is while he's being empathetic to our main characters, because he's like, hey, are you okay? While he's literally beating the crap out of something that you don't see. And they're having this really kind of sensitive, like, yeah, hey, listen, I'm just checking up on you. And it's another way of introducing a character. And that's one of the things that I always try to keep in mind as an artist, as well as a writer, is how you introduce characters into the story. That's so important. And this is a main character, uh, Earl Lincoln, who is going to play a major role in the story. And this is our first introduction to him. And uh, you see him beating something off camera, but that's, I'm not going to reveal that to you guys at this point. So I think that's pretty much like the, the sort of breakdown of two different approaches to telling a story. And so let me see, I'm going to scroll through here and see like, if there are any questions that I missed. I'll thank everybody for like, thank you for the great, for the kind words. That's really cool. Oh, awesome. Yes, RIP uh, Ellis Marsalis. Um, yeah, let me see. Okay, so I guess we can open it up to questions. Uh, you know, please, everyone feel free to like ask any, any and everything with regard to storytelling. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's why we're here. So uh, let me see. Yeah. See. Okay, how did I get into writing? The question is, how did I get into writing? Who are my biggest influences as a writer? Well, it's interesting because I got into comic books as an artist. Uh, and over the years, I've been fortunate to work with some of the, the best writers out there. Um, Greg Rucka, you know, Jeff Johns, um, Andy Diggle, uh, William Harms, um, uh, God, I'm blanking out on so many people that are really going to, please don't, don't hold it against me. But I've just been thankful. I've been fortunate to work with really great writers. And as an artist, when you're translating their scripts, it gets you into the flow and you, you look at how they tell a scene. And I always give Andy Diggle props. Andy probably is like the artist, the, the writer that I've worked with the most. And Andy's an amazing writer. Uh, he's the creator of The Losers. He's, he's written great things on like great arcs on Green Arrow. Uh, but we worked together on Thief of Thieves for Robert Kirkman's company, Skybound. And one of the things that, that I, I told Andy is that he makes it look so simple. Andy is deceptive. He, he is so economical with his writing that it's just really impressive and inspiring to um, for me. So that's pretty much, I almost went to writing school working with all of these different writers. But then I also am a huge film and TV buff. So I would really study TV shows and study how stories are constructed and how they approach, you know, characters and dialogue and and um, 
uh, I'm friends with Terry Winter, who is uh, one of the writers and producers of The Sopranos. He created Boardwalk Empire. And I love Boardwalk Empire. And I, I just love the writing of that show. And just, I would really kind of study the way the, the flow of the, the way they, the characters speak. Um, huge Quentin Tarantino fan. One of the things about Quentin Tarantino that I love and probably like my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie script is probably True Romance. Um, Cause each character is so distinct. Each character has their own, you know, voice. And that's something that I try to give in, in, in my writing. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how I got into writing, but I've been writing for a long time, but this is sort of like now when I'm, I'm really sort of getting out there and, and people are actually seeing what I've, what I've been writing. So, you know, you should be seeing more soon. Um, is there an analog for a movie soundtrack and comics? I don't know. Is there an analog for, I'm trying to understand that question. Is there an analog? Is there like a, um, I don't like usually like when I'm drawing, I tend to have the television on. Usually when I write, I'll listen to music and I, I listen to a lot of scores, a lot of music scores from films. Um, one of the, my favorite scores to write to is, um, I love American Gangster. That's a great score. Um, Hans Zimmer, I'm talking like Pacific Heights, Black Rain. Like, listen, I love all Hans Zimmer stuff, but I mean, like that's, stuff that I always, I can put that on to, I can put that on and I just sort of get into a groove. All the Dark Knight stuff, I was probably listened to a lot of um, the, the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight stuff when I was writing the Red Hood story. So that was pretty fun to write, um, write to, let me see. So someone asked, when did I say my new book with Megascope is coming out? It's coming out next year sometime. So I'm still uh, working on the art. So uh, I will be done with that in, a certain amount of time, <laughs> but, but yeah, we're looking at it coming out in 2022. The whole COVID thing just threw off everyone's schedule. And so fortunately, uh, John and the team at Abrams have been very patient. Mm -hmm. Let me see, someone asked, when you're working on your own work, how much character backstory do you write for your characters and do your stories begin with ideas for a character arc? Or do, you, do, you story idea, do your story ideas uh, start with the plot? Um, Yes, I always figure out the backstory super, super detailed. I actually write, my motto is that I write big and then I cut it down so that once you kind of figure out like the characters backwards, forwards and, and everything, then you can really shorthand them. It's so much easier to shorthand them when you've done all of the figuring out in terms of like where they grew up, uh, you know, you know what, what their conflicts are, like what their relationship to their families are and their siblings. I, I have like, backstories for all the characters that I that I uh, created for the Red Hood story. And for this, the heavy, like all the characters have major backstories. And like I said, and the fun thing is, is that once you figure all that out, then you just chop and you only sort of write what you need to. And you can also be more nuanced with what you're conveying about the characters because you know these characters in and out. So yeah, so I always flesh out the characters and then I always, um, there's always an arc, like where they're gonna start. And for those that you don't know, an arc is pretty much where they start and where they stop. And usually where they stop should be in a different place than where they started the story. Um, so yes, let me see. How long do you have to work on projects, both for companies and your own published work? <laughs> well, listen, everyone that you work, that you do work for would like you to do that in 24 hours. I'm exaggerating with the 24 hours, but everybody usually wants you to do it really fast. Um, when you're working for a company like Marvel or DC and they have a quick turnaround time, it's really a very shortened window in terms of how much time you have to either draw a book or write a book. Usually it's within five, maybe five to six to five, five to six weeks. Um, and then the book's going to come out fairly quick. Um, you, but if you're working in book publishing, the lead time is much longer. So they'll give you like a year to work on a project. And then it'll take them like six months to promote it. So it's a long lag time for that. Um, when you're working in advertising, it's a super quick turnaround. Like I just, um, I'm a contributor to Vanity Fair. I just did like a new spread for their April issue. So if you have a subscription, you can open up to the article about the people that were the, the book thieves, the international book thieves that is spread for that. They needed that pretty quickly. I think I needed to turn that out, turn the, that around maybe like I think a week uh, Justin, don't kill me if I'm, if I'm making you look bad. He's the art director. 
but it was a pretty quick turnaround on that. So it really depends on what genre, what industry you're working for. Um, advertising, super quick. Comics, quick. Book, book publishers, you have a lot of time. You see, do you have a preference for writing a 22 page issue length story or graphic novels? Do you find one or more challenging? Um, you know, I actually enjoy the challenge. I enjoy sort of telling me what, what are the parameters and then I'll figure out something according to that length. I know that when I was writing the, the Red Hood story, like I mentioned before, I was like eight pages in and I was still in the opening scene. I said, okay, let me kind of take a step back and I cracked out my classic copy of Batman Year One by Frank Miller and David Mazzucchelli. And I was totally amazed at how much story that they were able to cram into 22 pages of story. And I was like, listen, if they can do it, I can do it. So that was really challenging. Now with my creator on graphic novel for Abrams books, that I think I had 160 pages. That was like the, the amount of the script, but actually I came in at 155. So I was pretty happy with that. And and yeah, like in my first draft was pretty, I did, once I gave that in, they gave me a few notes, but nothing really major. And so that's pretty much what was approved. Yep. Let me see. See what the next question is. Hold on here. Is the hell is someone asked, is the heavy available somewhere? No, it's not on Amazon because it hasn't come out yet. So it's coming out in 2022. Someone asked, uh, Sean asked, how do you decide how many panels beats will happen per page? Do you keep it in mind when you're writing or do you make those decisions later? Well, since I've been working as an artist, I kind of know how many panels I want per page. I like to work maybe four to five panels a page. That gives me a nice amount of room to sort of put a lot of information in those panels. Um, so when I write, I tend to give the artist that same kind of accommodation, like four to five panels per page. And if I and I know that I gave Tony Akins on the Red Hood story more than four to five panels, but if I gave him seven panels, they weren't seven panels full of dialogue. So that's how I'll kind of balance that out. But it really depends on how much story that I have to convey. Let me see, somebody named Tiffany asks, what happens if you write a script and the artist doesn't quite <laughs> capture your vision? That, that did happen on the Red Hood. It was funny because there were a few times where I would say to Tony, can you kind of tweak that layout a little bit? And at one point, Tony was like, can you just send me a, a, a layout or like a sketch of what you're looking for? And I started to do it, but then I said, no, he's the artist, I'm the writer. So let me stay in my lane and I let him do his thing. Um, so, but that, but for the most part, I was really blown away by seeing how Tony would completely visualize something different than I thought. Um, he still followed the script, but it was a completely different way of approaching the story. And I probably would say um, for those, if you want to pick up the second part of that Red Hood story, which would be issue 52, there's a diner scene with different characters talking. And the way Tony visualized that, I was like, wow, it was really well designed and he nailed it, the acting. So I thought that was really great. So, yeah. Let me see. Michelle asks, I love the use of light and shadow in your work. Any advice on how to improve in this area as an artist? Any resources you would recommend studying? Well, Michelle, here's the thing. I use a ton of reference and um, I use myself as a model. I take photos of myself and I'm like, and I'll have the lighting. I'll adjust the lighting to sort of give me shadows. And one of the reasons why I use a lot of photo references because not that I, my artwork isn't photorealistic, but I want it to sort of convey, there's a certain level of detail that I just don't have a photographic memory to remember. So I find that when you tend to mix things up out of your, out of your head, at least for me, it tends to look more generic. When you look at a photograph of something, like if I were to take a shot of me going like this, there's certain details and full way this, the, the fabric is draping on my arm that I would not remember to do if I were making this up. Now I might get a couple of those folds, but maybe not all this little intricacy here. Maybe if I posed like going like this, maybe I wouldn't think about these, the way these fingers are resting on my temple. And those little details to me are what I'm looking for when I'm shooting myself as photograph, 
uh, you know, in photographs. And so I'll shoot like a bunch of different poses and then I'll choose the best one and I'll use that. And the same thing goes for lighting. You know, when you look at a photograph, you can see how the light will hit your face. And if you look at the bone structure and you really pay attention to how the shadow falls on my cheekbone here or my chin here or my nose here, when you look at that in the photograph, you'll start to understand that more. And I think that will definitely inform your drawing and it'll, it'll make it better. And that's what I try to do with, with uh, myself. So I look at, I use photo reference all the time. Yeah, let me see. Let me see. Not sure if we can ask art questions. Of course you can ask. Okay, Tom. Tom asks, uh, is the heavy drawn digitally? I was wondering what size you draw those layouts, if physical, they look amazing. Well, thank you, Tom. The check is in the mail. I am old school, meaning that I still draw things with a brush, with a Sharpie, and with a crow quill. So, Number one, because I'm too lazy to, to learn how to draw digitally, I don't have any interest in that. I, I have a lot of friends that do work digitally, and I am amazed by what they can do. But I'm listen, I'm too old for that. And plus, I like the text, the the tactile nature of feeling the brush in my hand. Um, usually, the boards, as you can see behind me, that's the size that I work, and they're the standard comic size art boards, which are about 11 by 17. And so, what I'll do is uh, I'll draw out everything, in, you know, in pencil and then in ink. And then I'll take it to my scanner, create a digital file, send that off to the company because all companies, you know, accept digital files. No one's sending an original work in um, by the mail anymore. That went out in the beginning of the, beginning of the millennium. So uh, yeah. So then once I create the digital file, I might tweak it in Photoshop and then I'll send it off to the company. But then I'll put the work on the, um, bullet the bulletin board behind me. And so while I'm drawing, I can kind of keep an eye out on continuity and I'll always see a mistake that I'm like, oh God, I, I'm screwed up on that elbow. So I'll take down the board and then tweak it and then I'll rescan it and I'll say to John, hey John, can you use, can you letter this file instead? And John's so gracious that he's like, John, anything you can do to make it better, I'm good with. So that's pretty much how I work. Let me see. Okay, let me see. Okay, let me see. I think I got the questions. Any other questions here? Did I, did I miss anyone's question? Hold on, let me check here. Okay. Okay, guys, I think I got all the questions. If there are no more questions, let me see. Uh, ladies of the society, am I missing any questions that I haven't seen? Hi, Sean. I think you got all the uh, questions. Okay. Unless anyone has one before we head off. Um, but yeah, this was amazing. I, I bought uh, both of the Red Hood, Red Hood books while, we, while you've been chatting. So you awesome. sold them. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. DC, DC are, you, are you paying attention to how I'm selling this stuff? Yeah, so. it was the uh, Birani uh, refs that saw me. <laughs> listen, listen, let me tell you something. I mean, because you're, you're, you're in New York, right? No, I'm in Portland. Oh, man. Okay, well, see, I thought you're in New York. Because if you were in New York, I'd say go to the Biryani cart because, my God, they're so good. Yeah. They're, oh, I'm just, I uh, due to the whole COVID thing, I, I haven't been in New York in over a year. And I'm looking forward to going back soon once I get my second shot. And I am going to the Biryani cart to get yeah. those rolls because... They are amazing. They look yeah. really good. Yeah. But yeah, I thank you so much for doing this. This was really great. I uh, learned a lot. And it was it's always a pleasure to uh, to listen to you speak and to also see your art and your stories. So uh, thanks for doing thank you it. so much, Kate. And everybody, thanks for tuning in. I hope it was somewhat interesting. Um, yes, be safe, be creative. And um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. But, but thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right.